before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. I think that this year and having things come out of lockdown and the ice is melting around the events makes everybody really thirsty to go to them and everybody has a lot of pent-up energy, a lot of wealthy people have a lot of pent-up money that they want to spend. So I do think that this year was special. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Last week, Throngs of art-loving party animals from 72 countries around the world converged on Miami for a week-long bacchanal of art-collecting, champagne-soaked soirees, non-stop socializing, and celebrity-studded VIP events that stretched into the night. Very weirdly, both of those things are actually true. The latest edition of Art Basel Miami Beach was by all counts a massive success with 60,000 people in attendance and booths selling out in nanoseconds amid boundless enthusiasm about traditional art and NFTs alike. And that's just the main fair. The entire city was lit up with art events, from the fairs to incredible museum shows to crypto art conferences galore that were filling the air with revolutionary fervor. So what was it like to hit Miami Art Week for this totally surreal, discombobulating edition? To answer that question, I'm very happy to be joined on the show today by none other than Annie Armstrong, author of Artnet News' beloved wet paint gossip column, who tackled the whole party thing down there with an almost alarming degree of gusto. So thanks very much for coming on The Art Angle, Annie. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Andrew. So fun COVID-era fact, I've been loving your work on the column for a long time since you've gotten here. But despite working together for a few months now, the first time we ever actually met in person was in Miami last week. And I can now report that you are taller than I expected. You have cooler art tattoos than I expected. (laughs) And I can report that your um, dad jokes come in at rapid fire much more than I thought they would. (laughs) Those dad jokes uh, preceded my baby by a couple decades. (laughs) Yeah, no, it was nice to meet in person finally. So how many Art Basel Miami beaches have you actually gone to? Was this your, your 10th, your 20th? This is my third, actually. Your third. Okay, so... Going back through all of your memories of these previous Art Basel Miami beaches, what did you expect this year and why? I expected it to be more or less how it was. I wish that I were to be a little bit more optimistic and think that there would be more security surrounding COVID protocols. The parties would be more careful, that there would be more check-ins about this sort of thing. And to Art Basel proper's credit, they did have a really good testing facility right outside of the fair. but. No, it was pretty much bedlam constantly left and right. Everything was back to its old scale, if not more, from what I've observed. It was just complete chaos. (laughs) And were you anxious at all? I mean, were you taking precautions? What was your own way of kind of keeping to some kind of sustainable level of safety? Right. Well, I'm fully vaccinated, recently got the booster, so I had that in my arsenal. But I was honestly pretty shocked at how lax things are in Florida. I think in New York, people think of New York as pretty chill about COVID protocols. I was surprised that even taxis wouldn't have masks on. My vaccine card must have been checked twice, if even, at parties. I mean, given all that, I just tried to take it as it came and follow my instincts, essentially. Like, if I felt like I was at a super spreading event, which I'm sure there were many of, I just kind of hung out on the sidelines of it and made sure that I felt like I was keeping a safe distance. But you know, what can you really do? I was kind of shell-shocked by this whole thing because I went from pandemic lockdown pretty much directly into baby world, into paternity leave. And then this was my like first entry back into the social realm. So if there was a vaccine for being socially awkward, I would have gladly taken it. (laughs) Uh, But how about you? How are your social skills doing? Were you feeling uh, rusty, feeling sharp? I feel like I'm pretty much back to normal. I think that for me, Armory Week was really when I was put to the test. Armory Week coinciding with Fashion Week had the same amplitude of parties as Miami did this week in New York, and that really put my social skills to the test. I feel like I would have these gaffes over and over again where I would find myself telling the same story to the same person, which I usually think I'm pretty good about. 
or just, I don't know, all of a sudden feeling like I uh, just kind of couldn't take the heat. So I had to get out of the kitchen. I thought about this when I was in Miami last week that after my very first Basel and the first time you get a Basel, it's totally overwhelming. There's just so much more going on than you could have anticipated. It's so much glitzier and more glamorous than you could ever predict. And I wrote an essay about this Berenstein Bears book. I don't know if you're familiar. Absolutely. Of course. The Berenstein Bears were uh, (laughs) my favorite Jewish bears growing up. Right. Yeah. Um, There's one Berenstein Bears book about how Sister Bear has too much birthday. Do you remember this one? Uh, Not particularly. (laughs) Well, there's a book about Sister Bear throwing her own birthday party and she just gets so overwhelmed by all the fanfare and all of the guests that come and she gets totally overwhelmed. She freaks out. She starts crying in the middle of the party. And I think that that is exactly what Art Basel Miami Beach is like and much more Art Basel Miami Beach during a pandemic. That's interesting because you were down there for a pretty distinct purpose. Everybody who goes to Miami is either, you know, pretty much a millionaire or billionaire who's there for fun or they're there to work <laughs> and, and to work nonstop hours and then party into the night and then wake up early in the morning and work again. So what was your mission in Miami this year? My mission going down to Miami, I think, was just to see what it looks like in 2021. After there was a worldwide standstill, how thirsty people were to get back to the way things were, if it was going to look different, if it was going to look the same. And I think it came out to look like both. Things are very different and things are very much the same. I think that another way of saying that would be that you were down there to write a gossip column. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Well, (laughs) that is also that. that. Yeah. And boy, boy, did I. (laughs) So how do you do it in a, um, this like maelstrom of countless parties, constant, you know, overload of events, um, you know, uh, conjoined with a constant FOMO of the events that you're not going to, how do you actually tackle it? What was your first day like? When I landed, I went for a walk down Collins Avenue just to see what I could see, see who's around in what paint there's a section called spotted and There's really no formula to me doing this other than I just go for these very long walks. I tell my editor, Julia, this all the time, that sometimes I just go for a walk around Dimes Square, and that is my work for the afternoon, and I fill out who I see around. So I did that at Collins Avenue just to see who was around. And then I think around probably 5 p.m. is when the real festivities started, and the events that I had VIP'd to started emailing me, making sure that I was coming. The first day I went to a dinner for Kasman out on, I guess it's the main island, at the Standard Spa. And that was my first event. And yeah, I think that that was where I was my most socially awkward because I was like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot what it looked like to be at one of these parties. And that was also the night of what I think of as the best party in Miami, which is White Cube's party at the Soho Beach House. What makes the White Cube party so great? Because it's the first night and I think everybody's very excited to be there. Plus, it's a stronghold. They have it every single year. And not that I've been to that many Art Basels, but I've been every year that I've gone. I think it's maybe the most VIP party that the average person can get into if you try hard enough, which just makes it the most fun to me. Like when I was there, who did I see? I saw Diplo. I saw the guy that played the main character in Candyman. And I was totally stunned to see him. I was like, whoa, I didn't even know you actually hang out with art people. At that too, I see like dealers that I know that I'm just friends with, people who work for those dealers that I'm friends with. So it's a good mix. And I think that since it happens every year at the same time, it just captures the excitement before the actual week begins. So just to step back a second, you know, you are not your average gossip columnist that goes out there and reports on actual celebrities who are really famous that everybody knows from TV, movies, etc. You are a art world gossip columnist who reports on people who are art world famous <laughs> and and the occasional celebrities who kind of stumble aimlessly into into this midst. And how do you spot art world famous people? Because art world famous people, you know, um, secretly are actually not not famous people. That's right. Yeah. They kind of blend in until you realize that they don't. <laughs> when I was first getting started in the art world, I used to just pour over Lindy Blonsky's seen and heard articles and just use that as a Rolodex of faces. I really didn't know who the big players were. And to me, growing up, not really in the art world, I just didn't know at all why it would be important to know who like a mid-tier dealer is. I didn't really understand why that would be important. And Now, having done it for a couple of years, existing in art for a couple of years, to be in such a niche of gossip, it makes it both easier and harder 
it's easier because it's smaller communities. People are a little bit less precious about their gossip because they assume that we're just one industry who really cares. There's not like a huge swath of people that care about art industry gossip. But then it's also harder because the community is smaller. Who is saying what can get back to you a lot easier. (laughs) So the stakes are high for if you're going to give somebody like me a scoop, because if it gets back to you, that could potentially look bad on you. So there's a lot of on background. There's a lot of off the record that I have to go and corroborate with two or three other people, depending on what's going on. So you did spot a couple of actual celebrities at the White Cube party. You mentioned the Candyman actor. What what's the general celebrity vibe down in Miami? Like how would how would you paint a picture of what it was like this year? Was it just like popping with famous people all over the place? How buzzy a scene was it? Well, I think at these parties there is a certain group of celebrities that you come to expect to see. For instance, Leonardo DiCaprio is known to hobnob with art world people all the time. But then there are ones that kind of come out of the woodwork. Like I was surprised to see Diplo. <laughs> I was surprised to see the guy from Keeping Up with the Kardashians, Jonathan Chabon, aka Food God. I was surprised to see Jemima Kirk, but though I guess she works closely with Pioneer Works, which I, I recently learned. Art world celebrities look a little bit like more white collar, like they're wearing a button down, they're wearing a suit, and then they have like a very nice Rolex. That's how you know that they're art world celebrities. But celebrity celebrities get to have a little bit more fun with how they dress. So that's kind of how I tell the difference. So who's the coolest art celebrity sighting of the moment? Ooh, good question. I may have an idea. Yeah, what's your idea? I think it's Beeple. Oh, (laughs) yeah. Well, cool is in the eye of the beholder, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) So you actually, I think, ran into Beeple down there. Is that right? I did. That's right. I saw him out of the bass. Okay. So paint a picture. How did it unfold? How was your interaction with Beeple? I mean, I was talking earlier about the first time you go to Art Basel Miami, you're always just so excited to be there. And that's how people struck me. I mean, he's just excited to be anywhere, talking to anybody, dazzled by it all. So it's kind of endearing to see him that way. He was at the Bass with Peter Saul. I ran into him first at the gift shop, just walking around, milling around. It's one of those things where he's such a new celebrity that I kind of had to triple take to think like, oh, is this somebody that I know personally? Or is that, oh, wait, that's that super millionaire NFT star. (laughs) And he seems like he's taking it all in stride. He was talking about how in certain rooms at our Basel, he gets absolutely hounded by his fans. Everybody wants to take photos with him. He has no idea what to do with it, really. Like, he's grateful and excited, but he feels overwhelmed, as anybody would. And then he'll go across the street to a coffee shop and nobody knows who he is and nobody cares. So that must be like a funny level of fame to toggle with. I mean, it's it's funny because down there in Miami, there were, um, it was kind of a, a tale of two art fairs where there were the traditional art people who were in the, you know, the main fair, in the satellite fairs. And then there were also these concurrent crypto parties, crypto events, symposiums, lectures, you know, meetups, yacht parties, etc. How much did they overlap and how much did you kind of, you know, flip back and forth between these worlds? Or were you mainly in the art quadrant? I tried to go to both. I really think that I would be a fool to not treat the NFT moment as something that's incredibly exciting that's going on because it is. And the parties that I went to that were NFT oriented had a huge art angle (laughs) to bury the title in there. For instance, the one that I wrote about in the column was Friends with Benefits. It's a name of a currency, I think. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that's correct. It's the guy that created little Michaela, the internet icon. He made a cryptocurrency called Friends with Benefits, and he threw a party where Azalea Banks played, Erica Badu DJed, and to get in, you had to have five of his cryptocurrency coins. And that party to me, I kind of forget who I saw there, but it was almost unilaterally art world people. I mean, not that I would recognize all that many NFT people, but there was a big blend. It's kind of inextricable at this point. Most artists I talk to are at least curious about getting involved with NFTs at this point. There's no artist really besides Peter Saul, actually, who is saying, like, I would never create one or be involved in any capacity. I don't think it's really a tale of two art puzzles. I think it's just this new medium is a wave crashing over the old guard. And you clearly have 
five uh, friends with benefits tokens. <laughs> uh, yeah, no comment on that. I think I got a press invite for that one. <laughs> you must have friends with benefits. At least, uh, you know, yeah, in, at in, least five of them. In other ways. <laughs> so what other parties did you go to that really stand out? What were um, some of the the highlights of your your tour of duty down there? My most fun night, I think, actually was when my fellow staff left was Friday night. Once the fanfare was over, a lot of people had left. I unpack this. I'm not sure if you're familiar. They're this podcast in New York. It's a film podcast. They threw a party with Matthew Brown and Clearing. And I think they had a list of like 40 different hosts. But the, I think those were the main ones. And they threw a party on Friday night at a bar downtown in Miami. That was a blast. And things had just kind of mellowed out by then. So it felt like everybody could relax a bit. That same night, GQ had a party and Playboy had a party and there was an event where Sonic Youth played. It, it just, that was the most carefree of the parties. So I would bookend my week. Monday, the White Cube party and Friday, the Ion Pack party were my favorite parties. Everything in between just kind of ran together. <laughs> and at some point in the middle, I, I believe you may have made an appearance at some place called Max Club Deuce. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, my biggest health fear second to getting Omicron, was uh, maybe getting trench foot at Max Club Deuce. <laughs> so this is a legendary watering hole in Miami Beach. It's right near the famous sandwich shop. <laughs> What's it like? Describe Max Club Deuce, the legendary dive bar in Miami. It's your classic dive. It's existed there since I think like 1913. Or no, that's Joe's. Joe's has existed since 1913. But I think Max Club Deuce is ballpark around there. It's one of the last places, I think, in the country where you can smoke cigarettes inside. Not that I do smoke, mom, if you're listening, but it's kind of fun to be in that milieu. And, you know, it's cash only. You go there. Who did I run into? I ran into um, No Horowitz. I run into Matthew Brown. I run into all of these very high level dealers who are paying five dollars for Budweiser. And it, it's like a great leveling ground. It's just a blast. That was maybe one of my favorite nights as well was going to Max Club Deuce. It's funny because if you go to Art Basel in Basel, Switzerland, everybody congregates at the Three Kings, which is this incredibly right. expensive, incredibly opulent hotel right on the river. And in Miami, you know, if you want to find some of the power brokers, the easiest thing you can do is go to this really uh, dingy kind of hole in the wall. I would call it seedy. <laughs> yeah, it's seedy. Seedy is... Um, is what it kind of epitomizes. So that's fun. Um, what else kind of stood out in your memory? Well, I think a lot of the stuff on the water was really fun this year. For instance, Half Galleries event out at Stiltsville was a blast to go to. But more than that, I think I was telling you about going jet skiing with 56 Henry, which was a highlight of my week, and I'm still a little bit sore from it. <laughs> you want to tell the story about your misadventures with Ellie Rines? Uh, yeah, classic. She's one to get into them with. Just two weeks ago, I went out upstate with her to go see her rocket launch, which was... Who is she, by the way? She's an art dealer in New York City. She runs a gallery called 56 Henry at 56 Henry, which is in Chinatown. I always think of her as just like, she's... The most fun. 56 Henry has a gallery. They get to have the most fun. Her openings turn into the wee hours of the morning. She has one of those laughs that sounds like she's been going out for days in a row. And I'm sure she would not be offended to hear me say that. So this year, her de facto gallery brunch was going jet skiing behind the Lowe's Hotel while the VIP opening was happening. So it was me, another dealer, and just a couple other people went for about 45 minutes and it was a beautiful day and I was just laughing thinking about everybody inside the fair not out on a jet ski in the in the Atlantic. What what, what would be your takeaway? How is the fair? Like is it is this something that is just going to continue happening pandemic or not people getting together going to art fairs going to these massive parties and just bustling through or do you think that this was some kind of weird little island of time that the pandemic forgot and that things are going to, you know, kind of lock down again? Well, I wonder if it's always going to be this extreme. I think that this year and having things come out of lockdown and the ice is melting around the events makes everybody really thirsty to go to them. And everybody has a lot of pent up energy. A lot of wealthy people have a lot of pent up money that they want to spend. So I do think that this year was special, but not that special. I think that Art Basel Miami is always going to be chaotic. It's always going to have wild, insane parties. It's always going to have that specific Miami flair, which is like a little bit seedy, but also incredibly opulent. So I think that this is more or less the art market. I think it's the perfect case study of it, actually. And then finally, you know, there is also some art down there. And... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't want to 
ask you about it in any kind of ponderous way, because that's not the tone of this episode, but what was some of the most memorably uh, fun art that you saw? I always have a soft spot for what I see at NADA. I think that NADA is probably my favorite of the satellite fairs. I think I was telling you that. Just because I see a lot of imaginative uses of their booths, specifically this year because of Ebony Haynes, her curatorial project where she was able to bring some galleries that might not otherwise afford a booth into NADA. So what I ended up seeing there was some excellent sculpture, some amazing textile works, but... I lament that every time I go to Miami, I'm never able to have time to go to the museums. I really wish I could have gone to see the Hugh Hayden show at ICA. It was great. The Hugh Hayden show was great. Thanks for coming on the show, Annie. This has been, um, I think, a very lively introduction of your whole MO (laughs) to our listeners. Uh, People should check out your column, Wet Paint, which is an Artnet News Pro joint that drops every week. And uh, it's a lot of fun. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manali, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.